Um, I'm Wilner, which is basically how well, Lou always called me. And um, let's say we met in 1985 on a uh, record of artists doing curd vile music. And it, the relationship started on the perfect note where I uh, wanted to talk about doing Pirate Jenny or Alabama song. And I said, why don't you do September song? When I was a young man carting the girls, and it was a typical, why the fuck would I do that? Hang up. And then call back a few minutes later, that's a good idea. You're a real producer. Yeah. And, well, we were in touch on and off over the years. You know, stayed in touch. I would say we were friends, but in starting in 1999 with the album Ecstasy, um, until now, um, I became his uh, faithful Indian companion, producer, advisor, um, like everything with him. And uh, so much happened in those years. I had so many triumphs and frustrations. Um, the big triumph, the one that I'll just never forget, is um, dealing with the uh, album that was talked about, Berlin, which was this uh, masterpiece that Lou made with uh, Bob Ezrin in the early 70s, who's over there. And, and um, that's, it's just this perfect, wonderful work, which, um, is held, in, I guess Rolling Stone put it in the best 500 records of all time, but when it came out, <laughs> um, Steve Davis, Rolling Stone, Lou Reed's Berlin is a disaster. <laughs> so patently offensive, the one wishes to take some kind of physical vengeance on the artist that perpetrates them. <laughs> and that was basically the reaction. So all those years later, um, it is Susan Feldman at St. Anne's. We built this huge show with choir. Bob came back and conducted the orchestra, and we took it on a tour through you know, Australian opera houses all through Europe, and I got to introduce it in Europe. And um, I'll never forget at Royal Albert Hall, which was it was the the gig to go to and completely sold out, and I just couldn't believe I was getting to say those words. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, now Royal Albert Hall, Lou Reed's Berlin, turned around, and there was just this bounding that he did on stage. That was such a hopeful, amazing moment, as well as uh, the same year metal machine music was talked about. Um, and Billboard at the time said, best tracks, none. <laughs> but it was, it always, someone transcribed it to a symphony orchestra. Those four sides of sound. And it became a piece that traveled with him. And he was just, do you believe this? When I handed that record in, they wanted to put me in jail. And 20 years later, there it was. Um, and it always happened that way. They never really, you never really got a break in that way because you would figure after a Velvet Underground breaking all those years later, and uh, you know Berlin, you know that and metal machine music that it would be known that you got to take take a second with this guy's work and take it in, but it didn't happen that way. It was always very venomous when he would put out. A new record to reconsider them. Um, in particular, the Lulu record um, of Metallica. Now, this is true. The record we were reading about four or five venomous, mean spirited reviews before one note was recorded. <laughs> absolutely true. We're in San Francisco. Uh, it was, you know, I mean, could not believe that. but really the best thing with Lou, the, the best thing all of us who had the chance was listening to music with him. He just 
was someone who can absolutely, he would cry at the right notes all the time, like tear up, or if everyone got the goosebumps, if he had it, he'd show you like this, the studio and all that. There was just um, nothing like it, and then just so heavy that we're here at the Apollo, where we were here about a year and a half ago, um, doing a benefit for the Jazz Foundation, and you know, went to the Apollo <laughs> and knows that song. And this is really, he was a rock and roll animal, but the music that he really, really, truly, truly blew him away was soul music and R&B. And he was, I mean, right there, just going nuts over James Brown's spot. And everybody that came through this place and Lou's relationship to black music was very unique. It's like one thing for a lot of uh, artists to, uh, you know, they like the blues and this and that, but Lou had this different thing that, I mean, that night he did, I, I guess I got him into this, the night time is the right time, full orchestra with Macy Gray doing the uh, hey, hey, part, and pulled, not only pulled it off, it was amazing, and then a few months later at a civil rights concert, he did A Change Is Gonna Come. And, you know, Sam and Dave, you know, Sam had him do Soul Man with him. And it was just, it was something, it's hard to say. And this was the guy, one time, I asked him, uh, 1977, when he put out this record, Street Hassle, was a song on it called I Wanna Be Black. <laughs> I said, well, did you want to be black at natural rhythm, shoot 20 feet of jism too, and fuck up the Jews? I want to be a black, I want to be a panther, have a girlfriend named Samantha, and have a stable of foxy whores, so I want to be black. But how did you get, I mean, that, you know, Jesse Jackson wasn't on the, I mean, how did you, he said, are you kidding? It was just white throat. Blacks loved it. Frankie Crocker is a guy who wanted to play it on BLS and they wouldn't let him. And, you know, who else? I don't know who else could. And then thought back at his hit single a number of years earlier. You know, the chorus, the color girls go. And it was just with such love on that tour. Um, it's, uh, he was even wondering if he need, could still say that. I said, yeah, it's just. This is the song, and then he, the first verse, he kind of went, and the girls go, to, you know. The second verse, he started doing it, and the balcony all yelled, and the color girls go. <laughs> so it was amazing. But we had this, you know, do this, this radio show at the end of her series called The New York Shuffle. Um, we did about 80 of them, uh, two hours each one, where we each played each other records. And... Lou was, uh, played all his greats and also was really interested in new stuff. He actually would play things like Nicki Minaj records and um, just, I mean, just stuff you would never believe. But his whole thing, the biggest compliment one could get from him and this is, hey, they're really trying something. Is it? You know, that's what it took to get a singer, just they're really trying something. And we played all these. He just loved this show so much. Um, and it was a, uh, we just loved doing it. And one time we were having dinner with Peter Gabriel, and uh, he was gushing about the show. And um, Peter said, Wow, that's amazing. What are they paying you for this? Went, we're doing it for free. He goes, Haven't you learned anything yet? <laughs> and, uh, but on this, once again, you would cry. I want to just play you a little bit to summon him up here. <coughs> Let's see. Hopefully this is working. There it is. Anybody? This was our theme song we opened with every week. And he said that this was his favorite record ever made. Anyone not know what this is? <laughs> it's Ornette Coleman, Lonely Woman. She said this was everything he tried to play on the guitar to get this style. He loved Ornette and Don Cherry. 
and we just started off each week with it. And the the other guy who he was loved so much and would be here and was so protective of was his love of uh, Jimmy Scott. Mm. You all know. He would often say that he has the voice of an angel and can break your heart. And we would just listen for hours at this. And he used Jimmy on his records. He took him on the road. And would love that we're hearing his voice in this place one more time. I don't know if he'll be traveling again. But the height of loose thing was his beloved Dion and Doc Thomas. So you know, uh, Dion, he just adored, I love and would say, his singing soars so high he can reach the sky and dance there among the stars forever. I saw him once to, together, it was at St. Anne's Church, Dion was doing a show there, and um, in between, uh, they had very strange bathroom things at uh, St. Anne's. <laughs> And um, was you know there was one on the side and one for the public in the back, and um, I don't know Dion was uh, impatient, having a hard hard time. So we dragged him outside in the courtyard at St. Anne's, advised him to start pissing on the side of the church, and then Lou took a stance like the bodyguard. Uh, one of the church representatives came out, looked at this, and turned into the wolf man. So he, yeah, that, and blue inflated to be like, um, it was like the Hulk. And, you know, he should be honored at Dion pissing on this church. <laughs> and just a lovely moment, but here's a um, little thing. This is the last thing I've played. And, the great Dion singing Doc Thomas' Troubled Mind. You might know this. Um, the Friday night before Lou died, uh, before Sunday, uh, Jenny Moldau and I got to go and stay with him that night. And um, we just didn't talk much, just lied there with him. And he had me DJ. And as we were playing this song, he sat up and told us that, you know, you, I am so susceptible to beauty right now. And just slide down. And, um, you know, very few words were said. And it was just a beautiful, beautiful night. I could still see the goosebumps on him. And, um... I loved him dearly, and I can't or never really want to say goodbye to him. And we're going to play something now that's going to be real interesting. The, uh, this is from May 1965 uh, at Pickwick Studios, where he was a staff writer writing songs for uh, Beach Boy soundalikes and everything. And this is 1965 when he went into uh, a room to record a song he just wrote. And this is it. Good performance. Do it again, you blew some words. Okay, can you do it again? Oh, Jesus Christ. Oh? Uh, yeah, but I need to build a level on it. It's really, I need uh, one, two. I like your performance, baby. You're in the recording studio. You don't want to do it, Tom? Huh? No, I'm just trying to figure out if I can do it. All right, can I run out? You got time? I can run out and get some water. Ah. Uh -huh. 
Thank God that I just don't know. 